Brethren in Christ, laude to Jesus Christus. This is Timothy Flanders from The Meaning of Catholic. I'm joined today by Craig Trulia. Craig, how you doing, brother? I'm good. It's good to be here. Excellent. Welcome to the show. So just to introduce everybody to Craig, Craig is a blogger at orthodoxchristiantheology.com. He has his own YouTube channel as well. He's also appeared on Reason and Theology and Sam Shamoon. He is a Phi Beta Kappa and Columbia University graduate. Craig's academic background is in both history and a critical approach to education, skills that he has apl applied both to his peer-reviewed research in the field of Neoplatonism and his independent research into the scripture and the fathers. I didn't actually know about uh, your peer-reviewed research in Neoplatonism. Tell us about that. Well, with a lot of things with academia is if you got a cross disciplinary thesis, it's very easy to get published. Um, and so because there's, it's the sexy new thing that where let's prove that this intellectual idea actually came from uh, a group of people no one expected. So I was reading uh, Al Ghazali um, quite extensively in a course in Muslim theology and philosophy. And something in what he wrote struck me just like something uh, that Pico della Mirandola wrote. And I went and read everything I could from both the guys, uh, from Marcelo Ficino, who uh, Pico della Mirandola learned from, went into the library of Pico della Mirandola, and pretty much put together the thesis that Pico della Mirandola ripped the idea off Al Ghazali. And uh, Typical of a class in philosophy, I got an A minus on the paper, even though it was published. <laughs> so I don't know. That's a, if anyone has taken philosophy courses in college, it's so hard to get an A. And you think when it comes to the social sciences, when you have something that is actually peer reviewed and it gets you know cited in books and stuff, that that should be an A, but apparently not. There's there's this <laughs> there's this platonic form of a perfect thesis on Al Ghazali and uh, Pico della Mirandola that apparently exists in my professor's mind um, years back. But that being said, so whenever someone follows up on the thesis, I continue to be a peer reviewer for that. I was also a peer reviewer for two different academic journals before then as well. So it's uh, so I'm not like super duper scholar. It's just on one little thing, but I'm the little I'm the guy who invented it. So now I'm the go to guy. Oh, nice. OK, <laughs> I, I didn't I didn't know Ghazali had anything to do with Neoplatonism. So that's intriguing to me. So uh, mm -hmm. anyway, so today's topic is Augustine and the Filioque controversy for viewers of Meaning of Catholic. We've covered what what Catholics would call the great or the Greek schism. What uh, more the polite term is great schism. Uh, because we both consider each other schismatic. So, um, Fair enough. but we have, uh, I have links be below on the previous shows where we, we sort of overviewed the Greek schism from a Catholic point of view. And uh, we didn't really dive too much into this particular topic. It was mainly focused on the papacy. Um, but this is really the other main bone of contention between East and West. It's mainly the papacy and the filioque. Would you agree, Craig, kind of boils down to those two in particular? I'd say more the former than the latter, but yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I know that uh, Sarah from Hamilton pointed out in the video that the papacy was not really a sticking point until later. The filioque was really uh, becoming very controversial very early. So, well, no, actually, I, I'd go the opposite way, but oh, okay, okay. I want to take your momentum. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, tell us about uh, Craig. Now, you wrote a series of articles that we have linked below as well on Augustine. The filio quest question mark and so tell us about why you want to write that and what is your perspective on augustine well what really inspired me was a show that we did together a year ago on reason and theology on augustine and the filioque and if you remember the show almost nothing was from augustine <laughs> and when i presented that topic it was like i said uh during that show i haven't looked a lot into this and you know here's i'm gonna be presenting someone else's research and so that's what I did on the show um, at that point. And so after that point, I had a curiosity. And for the fact that it's free to read it on New Advent, I want to read on the Trinity and just piece together the logic of it myself and let the chips fall where they may. So my motivation wasn't to prove that Augustine was um, large O or small O orthodox when it comes to pneumatology. 
because the sad truth is, as you pointed out, most Orthodox have already written them off anyway. I don't need to vindicate Augustine within the Orthodox worldview. It's kind of irrelevant. They've already wrote him off. And so what I started realizing was that what Augustine was teaching was Orthodox, and that makes my thesis, and it's not mine because Palamas predates me by centuries, but it, it makes someone making that point both an enemy to Roman Catholics and Orthodox alike because, the, because they're so against this idea that Augustine could possibly be Orthodox. Um, and so that's pretty much what motivated me was it was something I could read. I like to read things cover to cover, things that are large, um, things that are a challenge. And um, I read Beyond on the Trinity. I read uh, the responses to Max and Minus. Um, specifically is even more important work in some respects because Augustine wrote that after on the Trinity and it's on the same subject. Um, so it kind of distills some things without getting to those very long illustrations, which I think leads most people really not to be paying attention to the right things in that book. Okay, cool. Right. What, how would you characterize for the viewers, especially those who are not familiar with what Eastern, what Eastern Orthodox say about Augustine, how would you characterize the view, Orthodox view of Augustine, both both present, but you also made reference to Palamas and more historical views. How would you compare and contrast the present view with more historical views? All right, good question. I'm, I'm gonna start historically. So obviously in the beginning, everyone thought Augustine was the bomb other than Augustine himself. Augustine had a much more humble view <laughs> of himself. Right. And, um, but it's very clear after, very soon after Augustine's death, his theology has taken on a world of its own. It, it just permeates, you know, Leo the Great, for example, and his homilies and stuff that he was, uh, and obviously there's Prosper of Aquitaine, right? Who's also a saint. And, you know, he's Augustine's chief defender in France. And then we have these sort of uh, responses really to Augustine by St. John Cassian. So Augustine already was huge in his day, um, but Augustine himself had a much more humble view of himself because he was aware he was a Latin theologian and doesn't mean this is right because we should have faith that the Holy Spirit inspires people despite language and cultural backgrounds. Augustine's view was very typical of Latin theologians in their days where they thought inertia and wisdom was really in the Greek language in the East where the real heavy hitters were. And this comes out all the time in his writings. Um, but be that as it may, uh, it's interesting because I'm reading the minutes of Council Ephesus, and they didn't know Augustine was going to die so soon before the council. So he's actually a recipient of some of the letters from the council that go out to him. He could have actually been there. It would have been really cool if he was. Um, but that being said, obviously he wasn't. But very soon afterwards, Augustine started becoming very important in the East, but not for the reasons we usually think about. And it had to do with condemning people after they're dead. <laughs> which was an important thing in the Fifth Ecumenical Council. And so because Augustine talked about condemning people after they were dead, he was cited as a patristic authority. And to quote the Fifth Ecumenical Council, it endorses all the writings of Augustine, as well as Athanasius and several other fathers. They use the word all. So when people say, oh, well, Augustine's a saint just because of, uh, you know, his repentance and he, he achieved theosis. You see this in book nine of the Confessions. Um, I mean, he's a very saintly man. Um, but that's not why he was as important. It was recognized East and West. He was important as a theologian because that's what came out in the Fifth Council. They didn't mention his mother or anything in the council. They mentioned the fact that his writings and that's something that's easily glossed over. Um, otherwise, because of, for whatever reason, Augustine, probably because he just, he wrote so much, wasn't translated that much into Greek. And people forget that the Byzantine East, all the educated people knew Latin until Heraclius. And then it, it disappeared very, very fast. So for example, Maximus the Confessor was a, lack of a better term, a civil servant, you know, in Constantinople, which means who's fully fluent in Latin. And so when he went to North Africa, you know, decades after being a civil servant, he's a monk now, he read Augustine in the Latin because he was educated, he could read Latin. And so almost to the sixth ecumenical council, both East and West would have been interacting with Augustine in the Latin and it would have for educated people not been this massive impediment. 
then pretty much intellectually everything fell off a cliff. And if it was in Latin, the Greeks didn't know it. And if it was in Greek, the Latins didn't know it. And, uh, you know, so without getting too all to that, then how is there any, what happens in between? Well, for one, it seems to me that a lot of the debate on the filioque, um, cause that already began during Maximus day. We could get more into that, uh, as to what they really were debating about. Cause that's pertinent to against Eunomius and what they think this, the variants are to Basil, the third book that Basil wrote. Um, but by the time of Photius, as for example, he, uh, Photius the Great uh, wrote Mystagogi, the Holy Spirit. He's venerated as a saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, I'd imagine he's a pre schism saint. I don't know how, like, who officially decides who aren't saints anymore, even though it's pre schism. But he seems to have written off Ambrose, Jerome, and Augustine as being perhaps an error. And he said, we should not look upon the nakedness of our fathers and we should, you know, presume that they didn't mean what it sounds like they meant. And I think to anyone listening, that sounds like a kind of lazy apologetic. It's not super compelling, but it might have made more sense at the time when both sides had no idea of their intellectual tradition due to, you know, the Western theologians not having a background in the Greek and vice versa. So that has kind of become the popular orthodox mindset into the modern day. But before that, within the in the 13th century, Augustine was translated into Greek, um, as was uh, Later on, about you know, a hundred years later, Aquinas was. Um, there was a fascination of you know Latin theology, um, just like there was a fascination with Greek theology and Greek philosophy in the original languages. Um, but the Greeks were always, I think, a little bit uh, what's that? Stuffy, you know, like you know, Greek is the language of philosophy, so they were going to read Augustine the Latin. They wanted that translated into Greek. But there's no indication that anyone objected to anything Augustine wrote when it was in the Greek. In fact, uh, like I was alluding to, St. Gregory Palamas um, cites two different illustrations from Augustine in his 150 chapters. Um, Father Peter Hears is translating um, Gregory Palamas's um, work against the filioque. And so I couldn't comment on, well, does he cite Augustine within that work because it's not translated to English. And so that creates a lot of issues for us and scholarship commenting on this because a lot of this stuff isn't available in English or German in these typical Western languages in which theology is studied. In. So other than that, que uh, that I would say relatively brief, like a couple centuries where a Augustine would have been held in higher regard. Augustine is one of the saints, by the way, in the Council of Florence, which was attempted reunion council, that was quoted the most in the Latin side, but the vast majority of saints by both sides that were quoted were Greek saints. And we could get into the reasons for that. But it shows that they understood that by quoting Augustine, it would have had some sort of authority to the Greek delegation, right? Unlike maybe quoting post-schism saints of the Roman Catholic communion or something like that. Um, but now going to the modern day, it seems to have become kind of, uh, I don't know, in vogue to just attribute everything wrong with Western theology to Augustine. And, uh, and quite frankly, me saying this is going to get people to attack me. Um, but you see even Orthodox documents into, I don't know, 16 to 1700s quoting Augustine. You know, the Council of Dositheus is obviously citing concepts from Augustine. Um, you know, uses words like original sin, it's not a big deal. Um, and it really only starts, I think, in the 1800s. And I think it starts with really people interacting with Western theology when they're in the West. And so a lot of people will cite certain scholars that are Orthodox or formerly Orthodox um, as authorities on this subject, and but they don't even have Greek last names or Russian last names, you know, it, and it doesn't speak to the history of how Augustine was regarded within the Orthodox tradition. It's quite, kind of a recent thing, but because it's been like this for the last hundred years, people think that's how it always was. And so I sound like this contrarian by even bringing it up, but it's just basic reality. Yeah, uh, to my knowledge, Joseph Farrell, was the one who really brought into 
the Orthodox English speaking world, the idea that August basically everything that's wrong with the West from an Eastern Orthodox perspective comes from Augustine, more or less. That the thesis that he makes a bunch of metaphysical errors and whatnot, which causes c- civilization to decline and filioque and all this nonsense. Um, so I'm, I, I'm assuming that you don't ascribe to the thesis that everything that's wrong with the West came from Augustine. No, there's a lot of stuff from his terminology that obviously got adapted over time. And um, but to be honest, I'm not educated enough in the Western intellectual tradition where I could definitively say how that started. I just think we got to be careful not to overly simplify the thought of people like Augustine um, and then attribute later ideas that Augustine never, you know, never asserted and then say, well, Augustine's to blame. Um, I think we need to take Augustine on his own merits and not be anachronistic about it. All right, sure. Yeah, fair mm-hmm. enough. Well, I'd like to just kind of step through just quickly sketch some of the history, so some of the historical points. What I'm what I'm going to say here is I hope none of this stuff is controversial. I'm going to re- I'm relying on three Eastern Orthodox secondary sources here, particularly or convert sources, Sciencia or Sienski, uh, who wrote the Filioque book. Uh, I don't know if that's kind of, it seems to be the kind of the standard monk scholarship. Also, Yaroslav Pelikan, who was Lutheran and converted to Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, but the the origin of the Filioque really starts in Western terminology, which seems to trace back to Tertullian, who tr- coins a lot of terms like Trinitas, for example. But he uses terms that are, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to distinguish, I'm just going to say some Filioque, because what Craig is going to argue here is that there is an Orthodox Filioque, and there's a heretical Filioque from the Eastern Orthodox perspective. Uh, from the Catholic perspective, we would kind of lump them all together as to, as sort of one Filioque. But there is a Filioque language. And when we say Filioque, just for the viewers, if, in case you don't know, Filioque is the phrase that's contained currently in the Latin Nicene Creed and in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Filioque means and from the Son. That's where that term comes from. So this, this proceeding from the Father and the Son is something that the terminology goes back to Tertullian and other Western saints. So Tertullian is not a saint, but uh, Ambrose, Dam- Damasus, other Westerners. And then it gets picked up by Augustine, who also uses the terminology. Other Western fathers say similar things, which at least appear at face value to be similar in terms of proceeding from the Father and the Son. So um, that is, but like Craig, like what you were saying, and feel free to cut in any of any of this time if you want to add anything to what I'm saying here, but Augustine becomes the father in the West. He is the dominant force. He writes the most. His theology becomes sort of the sine qua non of the whole Western tradition. He is the authority. So in the, in the East, the authority, the the primary authorities are the three holy hierarchs. The uh, there's the, obviously the other fathers, but the three holy hierarchs in the East and the Chalcedonian tradition, particularly, form the 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 kernel, the sine qua non of the Greek tradition. Whereas Augustine, as a singular figure, becomes the singular figure of the Western tradition. And so there's there is this. Uh, I don't know if you want to add anything so far. I'm I'm about to get to Maximus. Yeah, I would just add that some of the English translations of what we have, which are we, when people read these, read this, let's say online or even in books, they very rarely look at the footnotes or follow up in these things or even then look into the Latin manuscript to see what's really said. And so I would caution people, if you're going to do research on this, you can't just Google fathers that use the Philly Quite and look at one-liners. That, that's really, really bad. Um, and if you actually look up some of these citations and then look up even in the Latin what is really said, you'll be very disappointed with what was actually said compared to what you're seeing quoted over and over and over. Um, but... The term filioque, I would agree with you, is obviously found in the Latin. It's way before, you know, the Arian, you know, this uh, the anti-Arian creed in Spain from the Council of Toledo, right? Like that's what always gets attributed to, but the word itself predates that substantially, and obviously it's in Augustine. Um, but for example, people think it's in Hilary Poitier, but it's actually a faulty English translation. So it's. We just we have to be careful. It's not as common as people think, due to the fact that it's sometimes translated really 
badly. Okay, fair enough. I always want to check back with the primary sources, absolutely. And so in the West, the, the prime difference in terms of creeds is that there are three creeds in the West. The primary creed in the West is the Apostles' Creed, which actually doesn't have any mention of a procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son. The other creed is attributed to Athanasius, called the Athanasius Creed, which does have the Filioque, and then the Nicene Creed, which, as Craig mentioned, is added by St. Leander, allegedly not, not always clear exactly in all the documents, but sometime around 589 in the Council of Toledo, as the Arian Visigoths are converting to the Catholic faith. And so there is this very pervasive liturgical tradition and patristic tradition, which does have this, some sort of terminology that at least has some similarities with the Filioque way that later develops. So uh, in, later in the 16, 600s is when we have a, a pivotal moment where in the East, there is the monothelitism heresy raging and Maximus is ends up defending the Pope who issues a synodal letter which has some filioque language in it. And so Maximus defends the Pope and says that this is a different terminology, which basically, basically to sum up, Maximus essentially assert, asserts that this is different terminology that means the same thing. And the central issue here, which we'll get into more when we talk about Craig's uh, writing on Augustine, the central issue is that to the Greek mind, there, there is, the terminology in the Nicene Creed is ek parevsis, which means to take origin out of, whereas the Latin terminology is uh, pro cetera, which is much more general, means to just sort of happen in front of, and its other prepositions are added on, but it doesn't have the same originating connotation of an origin. And so what St. Maximus says, the key phrase from Max and Maximus, this letter in the 600s is, the Latins know that the Father is the only cause of the Holy Spirit. That's the key phrase. And this letter, in fact, is used by both sides to try to support their side on the Felic way. So it's not entirely clear, uh, but it has been used by both sides. Both sides think it's clear on their side. But the only cause language is the key point there. Uh, anything you want to add on that, Craig? I want to add maybe two things. One would be people forget the Pope was Greek. <laughs> He's a Greek speaker. Maximus was Greek. People forget how many of these people were, in fact, Greeks that were in Italy at that time because they were under Byzantine occupation. Um, so it's very easy to look into this and go, oh, well, you know, this this is a spat between East and West. It actually was a, a spat between East and East, just that these guys were in Italy and weren't under the thumb of the emperors directly. It gave them somewhat of a buffer. So that's something that's worth pointing out. These are Greek theologians understanding the Western tradition and not having an issue with it. And I think that's something that people don't realize, you know, they don't look into that nearly enough. We're talking about Greeks versus Greeks at this stage still, not Greeks versus Latins, um, even though there's obviously a Latin tradition. Um, the other thing I would add would would probably be getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, would be um, both sides appropriated Maximus letter, um, but because it also, it originated really in pro filiquist uh, Florigelium. It wasn't found, the letter to Marinus, which is the letter that uh, Timothy is referring to, wasn't found in like, uh, I don't know what the term is, but like these compendiums of father's works. Like after they died, they purposely write them all in like one volume because the idea was to prevent forgeries. So if you have a volume and there's six of them around, and then all of a sudden there's a new volume copy from an old volume and it's got something else the others don't have, that was an ancient way of, the, or I guess middle, middle Ages is an ancient, but it was a ye old way to prevent forgeries. Um, so there was issues with the letter Marinus in that it was not found within the standard compendiums of Maximus's work. Um, but it's interesting that we're going to find that it was the Latin side that disowns Maximus on this point. Yes, it becomes controversial later on. Uh, which we'll get to. So the other key point, so basically the, the the Western language is somewhat controversial for a brief moment with Maximus, but it kind of dies away. There was, there's a, a little spat that happens between some monks uh, 
but in when the Franks go to the Holy Land, but it becomes really acute when the political rivalries begin to really show their face with the crown of Charlemagne in 800 and later Photius within a few generations. And this is at a time when the Western Roman Empire is sort of resurrected in a new form. And there's a, an intense political rivalry between the Western Roman, Holy Roman Empire reborn and the Eastern Roman Empire still struggling against the Mohammedan oppression. And this is a time when an interesting thing happened. Pope Leo III tries to keep the peace by putting a, a bronze plate of the Nicene Creed without the Filioque in Rome. And yet he specifically tells the, so he tells Charlemagne and the Franks to stop reciting the Filioque. And yet he explicitly confirms this, t this doctrine as Orthodox. So he sort of is playing a double game that the popes were in the, in the middle of for some time since they were trying to work out their political loyalties between new Rome and the Carolingian empire. Um, so Leo the third is an interesting figure in that, in that regard. Um, and in a few generations we have Photius, which is where the political rivalries are getting more intense because they're fighting over Bulgarian territory, which was actually taken from the Pope earlier during the iconoclast controversy. And so Photius is the one who writes the first sustained attack against the Filioque as a, some sort of heresy from the East. And this is, as you mentioned, this is uh, this is something that makes the idea of Augustine being much less respected. Uh, that's one origin of that. And uh, it is the first big attack on the Filioque from the East in the context of these rivalries. Um, so I, that's all of the first one I wanted to mention that we can talk more about when the Filioque gets inserted and it's also as well Thomas, Lyons and Florence, but you wanna add anything before we move on to- yeah, I'll just add yeah. that theology in the West was not in such a good state. Um, the main deposit of where writings are kept and studies were done back then, though colleges did exist, that's kind of an anachronism, would have been in monasteries and pretty much they kept getting ransacked by different Germans, Vikings, all this stuff. And so really outside of Ireland's in Rome itself, really, um, a lot of information was lost in the West. And the reason I bring it up is when uh, you get into a, recite, a recitation, the creed in Nicaea II, um, it says that the um, spirit proceeds from the father by the son. And you would think this would not be a very controversial statement. And the, the Carolingian theologians were all up in a theft because they saw this as a contradiction of the filioque. And so I point this out because it, it's, and the Pope at that time, uh, I don't want to get the name wrong. I think it's Adrian the um, first was arguing against the Carolingian theologians. So the reason I point this out, it shows that even at that earliest stage, there wasn't this cogent idea in the West of what they even meant by the Filioque, that they could be, they were divided amongst themselves over the issue. Um, and that's that's why I point out the Carolingian theologians took issue with Nicaea too, not only, of course, because they were sort of iconoclasts at that time, um, was also over the issue of the way the Greeks understood the procession of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and that's a good point to concede from the Latin side because many of the Latin, you know, we may criticize the Greeks as making minutia out of beards and things of that nature, but that was also being being uh, pushed by the Latins, especially the Franks, in their rivalry with the Greeks. And at, at various points, they they asserted that the Greeks had actually removed the Filioque from the creed, which is obviously incorrect because the now, can i interrupt you on that point yeah, go ahead. this is something i seriously looked into i i can never people like respectable scholars make that point you just made i've never seen that in the letter of excommunication right where they actually accuse him of it i'm like am i is it just a bad english translation have you seen it i mean am i just not being observant i don't know i have to, I have to track down where that's said i know that um I, I think I'm pretty sure I, I saw it in Pelican when I was just reading it of the, the Carolingians because they write the, the Caroline books against the East, both, mm -hmm. because, both because they have a faulty translation of the Nicene 
uh, Nicaea 2 because they think that they're actually worshiping icons, giving them Latria. So mm -hmm. they're writing against that, which is all incorrect. And they're also writing against a removal of Filioque. So I'll have to track down the reference okay. on that. Yeah, the but, removal part, remember, I was talking about right. the 1054 letter, but. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I've heard, yeah, I've heard that it happened there too, but I, I haven't examined the text either. But okay. um, in any case, we, the Latin certainly cannot accuse the East of removing the Filioque. The Filioque is not in the original Greek. It's, it's, that's a false claim, obviously. Um, I think that the, the assertions of the West having the liturgical Filioque both in the Athanasian Creed and in the Nicene Creed in the North and with various fathers, they were identifying that this must be a part of the faith. This must be a part of the universal faith. And to a degree, I would say yes, but there's also a lot more nuance to that, both from the Alexandrian school, as well as the Antiochian and Cappadocian school, especially Damascene that you bring out in your, some of your writings. Um, but moving on a little bit, so the, the Fideoque is actually sung in Rome for the first time in the 11th century in the context of a massive reform movement in the 11th century, which is taking back Rome from what's known as the first pornocracy, which is where Rome was dominated by a bunch of terrible people and a very evil period, dark age of the, of the papacy. But it was being supported by the, the, the Holy Roman Empire, and they always sung the Filioque. And so in the context of the political situation, it was sung for the first time in Rome, supporting this reform movement. And then we have the Crusades, which we can't really get into all this stuff, but uh, the end of the Crusades is the Council of Lyons, and then later, 200 years later, Florence. And we also have Thomas in that. So long story short, I just want to wrap this up and get more into your arguments, Craig. Um, essentially, Lyons and Florence confess the Filioque and justify the Nicene Creed with the Filioque as being in accord with the Fathers. Uh, particularly Augustine, that is what all the the apologetics say. They cite Augustine primarily as supporting the Filioque doctrine present at Lyons and Florence. So that is rejected by most of the East. And so that is really the bone of contention to this day. So long story short, and we didn't really get into Thomas, but we can. Um, anyone think you want to add on that before we get more into your Augustine writing? I want to say, if we're going back to the first millennium, and I don't want to, let me just say something Father Price talks about if you actually read the footnotes. Um, and uh, I'm not saying I'm going to endorse this conclusion, but it's something worth considering. When you read the minutes of the ecumenical councils, you sh we all know that in Ephesus, they said adding anything to the Nicene Creed, you know, is anathematized. Yet in Chalcedon, which is about 22 years later, um, they cite a creed, and it's this creed from Constantinople I with slight variation. And we find, when we just read 4th and 5th uh, and fifth century documents, that both the Nicene Creed and the creed from Constantinople I, they exist with minor variations all over the place. Now, um, I don't think there's an answer to why this occurred that I'm totally convinced by, but I'll tell you what Father Price's uh, observation is. And his observation is, that yes, there's this canonical norm for a creed that can't be changed, but local tradition was allowed to prevail in these different cases. And so the reason I bring that up is when someone says, oh, well, the West introduced a, a terminology, let's just presume for a second it's orthodox with a small o, right? It's an orthodox terminology. They're using filioque in the correct way. Um, that would have not been a violation of Ephesus unless we're going to consider what everyone did in the fourth and fifth centuries, a, a violation of the fact that these creeds were canonized. They're made a rule in ecumenical councils. Um, and so it really isn't until the eighth ecumenical council, which had been Constantinople 4 at 879, 880, where you get a very strict, you know, specific, you can't mess with the Constantinopolitan Nicene Creed. Right before that, it really was kind of up for grabs in some respects. Um, so I only point that out because people, I don't think, appreciate the amount of diversity there was in the creeds. 
I mean, and how they were adapted for a different locale. Uh, so I'm not going to say that means it was good that the Philly Koi is added. I even think someone who um, is Roman Catholic could see all the problems this caused that, you know, maybe wasn't worth changing the creed over. So I don't, I'm not making that argument. But I'm just saying as a, a general point, this idea that creeds never could be altered in any jot or, or, or you know, tittle or any different, you know, any word can't be altered. That really only became very clear by the Eighth Ecumenical Council. Before that, it wasn't so clear. Yeah, that's a good point. And I didn't know that from the Greek side. I, I know that there's three different interpolations in the Latin Nicene Creed besides the, or including the Filioque rather. Um, but that's, that's a really good point. There's on the, on the Eastern Orthodox side, there is, on the one hand, there is the objection to unilaterally changing the creed without an ecumenical council before Lyons, and which has to do with the papacy on the one hand, and then there is the doctrine itself. And so we're kind of focusing on sort of more of the doctrine itself tonight, but, um, Anything more you want to say on Lions or Florence before we get into your thoughts, Craig? Um, no, I just think it would have been interesting. Just like if Augustine had made it to Ephesus, um, that would have been real interesting. It would have been interesting if Aquinas lived to go to Lyon, but it didn't work out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas famously carrying his his <laughs> God wanted to spare him from all the all the uh, misattributions that he used in his in his contra aures aurores Gregorum. So yeah, Aquinas famously died on the way to Lyons, and Bonaventure was the one who took up the cause at the council with the Greeks at the time. Um, so let, I want to touch briefly on what how does one approach this 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 controversy because obviously from the Latin side we assert that we have Augustine principal principally, and we also have these other Latin fathers. We also cite Cyril and Alexandrians in particular uh, with filioque language to support the doctrine of Lyons and Florence, whereas on the Eastern Orthodox side, either on the one hand, they dismiss Augustine and say, well, he was just er erroneous and Damascene and the Cappadocians are correct and Photius is correct, Blacarni is correct against Lyon and Florence, and they cite their own fathers. And uh, on the other hand, Craig takes a slightly different approach regarding Augustine. But Craig, how do you approach this this controversy? This is something that many souls are pondering over who are trying to, maybe Protestants who want to join the Apostolic Church, they don't know where to go. How do you, what are some principles that you use to confirm that you're in the right church? You could, well, to confirm you in the right church, we'll get into the intellectual issue. That's a spiritual issue. You need to pray, you need to fast, you need to read your scriptures. You need to go to services. Everyone wants a silver bullet. Give me a book I could read, you know. Uh, give me an argument. Give me a debate on YouTube and I'll figure it all out. You need to get your heart right with God and you need to do it the way God talks about. So it's by prayer and fasting, you need to be reading the scriptures. You need to be attending services. So um, now let's pretend you did all that. Let's put that aside for a moment. That, that's, that, that's, that's a, I wholeheartedly agree with that as the primary <laughs> thing. <laughs> too much intellectualism, uh, as Ecclesiastes says, uh, too many books is the weariness of the flesh. So we, yeah. we people, people more scholarly than both of us have been pondering over this and writing about it for centuries and still hasn't worked out. So no, yeah, and, pray and fast. And, and that's why, for example, both of us, when we made you made the decision to be roman catholic i made the decision to be orthodox we know more now than we knew then but yet we still made a decision on what we would almost consider now insufficient information and what it comes down to is we always make a decision on, on insufficient information so we need to have some humility about that that you could be wrong or you could have everything correct at your disposal but again you have a fallen mind you could misunderstand it um and I'm not saying you, I'm speaking generally, obviously. Yeah, this, uh, so, I have a fall. <laughs> yeah. so, so that being said, what should we do if we're trying to have the, the mindset of humility and of patience and of really imbibing in the word of God? And um, if you're actually within the church, you're imbibing the sacraments, you're getting God's grace that way. Um I think we need to read the fathers cover to cover. And I think that's what's lost in all of this. Um, 
And we kind of take for granted that, oh, bishops and ecumenical councils, they did all that hard work. Well, not really, not all of them anyway, right? Like Aquinas would have done that, right? Or um, St. Mark of Ephesus would have done that, but it doesn't mean they all did. Like, for example, um, with uh, Leon and, and John Beckos, Beckos had a, a very large florigellium, and in retrospect, like almost everything was just bad. And then both sides had really bad florigelliums. I'm sure what Photius was reading from when he was dealing with the Philoquitish in the ninth century was really bad florigelliums. People really weren't actually reading the fathers. And so probably the best place to start, because we can't solve all the spiritual stuff tonight, is if we got an issue, you can't just read a, a bunch of quotes you know, in a row or read a secondary source, you actually have to take the father and do the work and read them cover to cover. And I advise praying to that saint so that, you know, they can pray to God to give you wisdom, <laughs> you know? So you really need to imbibe in the saint to understand what the saint is teaching. Just having a sentence out of context is not going to do it. Yeah. And just for the viewers, a flora jam Florigelium refers to basically a list of patristic citations, which are attempting to prove a particular point or peti petition or a position rather. So that that's what's referred to with that. So yeah, I like what you're saying. That's really that's what uh, that's precisely um, the primary method that we all need to do more of, which is more prayer and less thinking and talking and debating. More prayer, absolutely. Um, so assuming we've all done the prayer, we've all done the prayers and fasting, we're all focusing on that. Um, since we can't all pray together. <laughs> <laughs> we can try. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's get into the issue. So I, I think, so I'm just going to say the the reason that I, I, I linked my writing, I don't know how much your writing was a reaction to mine, Craig, but I, I the, the first. Only one article got me started. I, I haven't first, revived okay. in any of them. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, basically the the issue that I see that I saw with this, that when I was Eastern Orthodox myself, when I did not, I was not convinced that the filioque was a heresy because I was reading all of these Latin fathers that confessed the filioque. And when I compared the doctrines of Leon and Florence, and I compared Augustine and, and looked at the fathers, I could not find a way to say that there were they were of a different substance and the the idea that the, i mean the basic principle that i accepted as as a principle of knowledge was that the consensus of the fathers and the saints is the truth and when a bunch of saints are saying a given thing then i i tend to trust it as uh more enlightened and and some an authority and so i could not really bring myself to accuse as it appeared that Photius was doing, Photius seemed to be accusing Augustine, Ambrose, Jerome as being sort of lesser fathers, lesser, less enlightened, and uh, obviously conceding whatever human limitations any saint is dealing mm -hmm. with. I was not prepared to sort of denigrate the Latin fathers from what, from what I, from my perspective, and that, and only the Roman Church I found. In, in my, from my, obviously from my view, was willing to put all the fathers sort of on an equal playing field, both East and West, Latin and Greek. But uh, from my view, I, I've, I believe that the sort of the Eastern mindset was sort of excluding the Latin fathers, as Photius appears to be doing when he excludes the filioque. Um, and I, I think that Maximus takes the proper approach, which is saying that these are different ways of saying the same thing when you really look into the language and what they're saying they are different ways of saying the same thing and we have all he said he makes reference to the unimat unanimous documentary evidence of the latin fathers besides cyril of alexandria and i've looked at those texts and i agree with maximus i think that that is the uh doctrine of lions in Florence. Now, I know you also agree with Maximus in a different way, obviously, but that's for, that's that's my perspective. That's really what convinced me, or, or I guess failed to convince me that the Filicoi was a heresy. And that's what one of the aspects of my own conversion to Rome. So that's that's how I approached it. And Craig, what do you think, How and what are the, some of the principles that you approached it from that side, that point of view? 
The, well, for my conversion to orthodoxy, to orthodoxy, the filioque was really not a design factor whatsoever. Um, I won't give the whole story why it shows orthodoxy, but it seems to me really um, whoever the church is is going to have the right teaching on the topic. <laughs> You know what I mean? So it's about finding what the church is, and it's maybe that's an intellectually lazy way of doing it. Um, but now, you know, a few years removed, the more I've studied this topic, the more, in my opinion, humble opinion, the orthodox view of pneumatology is absolutely correct and irrefutable. And I think if you understand the point that they're driving at, um, this sort of later scholastic um, speculations um, about, you know, orders of priority within the Trinity and whatnot kind of become, they're speculating about stuff sort of divorced from the tradition of the fathers. And and that's why I don't think it's coincidental. That doesn't mean they weren't well-meaning. Um, I think no one would accuse Aquinas, for example, of not being well-meaning. Um, but, you know, so much of what he bases argumentation upon is, was forgeries, like you referred to. And Aquinas himself was even a little suspicious that he was dealing with forgeries, but he went ahead anyway, you know, that was going to let him stop him. But it's, it seems to me almost to greatly simplify this, that if you look at the history of Western theology, it's almost like a game of telephone. And it's just slowly changes over time. And, and that's given the veneer, obviously, of doctoral development, but that's this is just another way of looking at the same thing. You can see how oh, this is something being clarified over time. Um, as an Orthodox Christian, where it appears to me the same exact doctrine from the fourth century is the same doctrine that was elucidated centuries later, that it seems to me almost like this game of telephone, that a little's lost over time, then a little's clarified in the wrong direction, and then you get this other thing. And that's why my decision would be that the filioque of of Leon's and Florence is different than what at least I could speak intelligently about what Augustine said, um, because I've read Augustine more, you know, in far more detail. You know, when it comes to let's say Cyril of Alexandria, a lot of people will take Greek fathered filioques and they're missing from the fact that when they describe what they were talking about, it's the temporal procession. And we even see this also in On the Trinity by Augustine. So it's so important you got to read these guys in context. But so much of this argument, including in the fifth, in the seventh century, rather, with Maximus, was people dealing with Florigellians. And so, you know, it's almost like people being lazy is what caused this issue and people being lazy is what continues this issue. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, um, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't wouldn't disagree with that. Um, I, and somebody in the comments, I just want to clarify something. When I, when I say of a different substance, so the the idea that so Craig Craig's assertion here is that Augustine had an orthodox filioque of some kind that was orthodox, fully orthodox, but then over time it becomes a different substance, meaning it's a totally different doctrine with Aquinas and then at Lyon and Florence. And so that's the assertion, and that's why uh, Orthodox, like Craig, would, would assert that Leon and Florence are heretical, whereas other Orthodox may just dismiss Augustine outright and that's start. A, it's, that's far easier so, just to do that. True, yeah, it is, <laughs> it is easier. So um, let's get into the I, what I want to put this in context because um, let me just read. I want to read the Florentine Decree because it's not long. And um, when I read through your writing, see the thing, this is this guy had the same experience that I had before, because when I read through your writing, I was matching all the quotations from Augustine that matched with the Florentine doctrine. So here's the Florentine doctrine. <clears throat> this is the decree for the Greeks. Um, we define that this truth of faith must be believed and received by all Christians so that all must profess that the Holy Spirit is eternally from the Father and the Son, and he has his essence and his subsistent being at once from the Father and the Son, and he proceeds eternally from both as from one principle and one spiration. And I match that with De Trinitate, Augustine, Book 5, Chapter 15. And then moving on, it says, We declare that when the holy doctors and fathers say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son, this tends toward the, that understanding which signifies that the Son, like the Father, is also what the Greeks call cause and the Latins call principle of the substances of the Holy Spirit. That is what I matched with book five, 15. And then finally, 
And since the Father himself has given to his only begotten Son in generating him all that the Father has except of being the Father, the Son himself eternally has from the Father, from whom he is eternally generated, precisely this, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son. And that accords with Augustine, book 15, chapter 27. Um, so let's get into, uh, Craig, I want you to present your thesis um, on why you think that this is not in accord with Augustine. <laughs> And we can get into more of the specifics and, and try to distinguish this. Go ahead. I'm going to give an overall view. And then if we want to go into some nitty gritty over actual passages, we could do that afterwards. Because like, for example, book five, paragraph 15, I, I think it's very specifically about the temporal procession. Uh, uh, procession. Um, but it might help for both of us just to look at a large overview of really what the you know, on the Trinity is about, you know, what is driving Augustine in this work? Can you just explain temporal procession real quick? No, yeah. So temporal yeah. procession would be that when the, when the son says, you know, he's going to return to the father. And if he doesn't do that, he won't send the spirit. That's when the spirit is sent to us, the cr creatures, right? So that wouldn't be the eternal procession, which should be the origin of the Holy Spirit. I also want people to take into account that whatever happens temporarily in the temporal realm, you know, in the space-time continuum, also reflects the eternal realm. So you can't just easily dismiss something as merely a temporal possession and say that, that there's no ramifications in the eternal possession because God's not utterly inconsistent. You know, God's eternal nature permeates how everything operates in this creation of his. Um, so we could get more into that in a bit, but... I just want to put that out there, but that all doesn't mean you could just, you know, immediately discount that, oh, it's just temporal procession. It doesn't matter. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because, for example, Christ was incarnate um, by the Holy Spirit, right? So the Spirit, in that sense, preceded Christ. Christ, uh, the, when the Eucharist is consecrated, right, in the Orthodox tradition, the Spirit is called down. So the Spirit precedes, you know, the the transubstantiation occurring. And so, which not coincidentally reflects also um, the incarnation, right? So we see these things as connected. And so think of the consecration and think of the incarnation and go, okay, well, that's the temporal realm as well. Well, how's that affect what happened eternally? We have to think of both these things. So with that said in the onset, I just want to give a, if I can have five minutes, uh, an overview of 15 books of on the Trinity. <laughs> so Augustine in book one kind of sets everything up and he quotes Romans 11, 36, 36. And this is what he believes is how we can perceive everything about the Trinity. And uh, Romans 11, 36 says, for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be the glory forever. Amen. So Augustine's arguing for of him um, has to do with the father, um, through him has to do with the son, and to him um, or in him, depend is what, if you read the New Advent translation, um, would have to do with the Holy Spirit. So if we're going to understand why this is important to, to Augustine, Augustine sees all hypostatic differences as a matter of relational differences between the persons because they're one essence so you can't perceive any difference if the person's in their essence because same thing right <laughs> they're one substance um so hypostatic differences or personal differences so the difference between the persons of the trinity has to be perceived relationally that's the only thing that is different between them is that they relate to one another differently and then you can perceive that they're different people so Again, hypostases. So the father's relationship with the son is the through, right? Because the only way we could see something's through the son is by perceiving a relational difference. So that would be the through. And the harmony, Augustine argues, between the father and the son is the in. So when we see for of him and through him and in him are all things, then when we see harmonies between the father and the son, we could perceive the spirit. And so this is important because that's the context of all Augustine's illustrations, 
um, in On the Trinity. And this is the context of the filioque within On the Trinity, which is why everyone tonight's even interested in the topic. Now, I want to read a quote, and it's from Book One of On Christian Doctrine from Augustine. And it drives home my point to show I'm not taking Augustine out of context. Augustine writes, and the Father is unity, and in the Son, equality, and in the Holy Spirit, the harmony of unity and equality. And these three attributes are all one because of the Father, because of the Father, all equal because of the Son, and all harmonious because of the Holy Spirit. All right, so because of the Father, they're all one. So my interpretation as an Orthodox Christian, and I think most consistently also with Augustine's writing, is when he says, all one because the Father, he's speaking of the Father being the sole cause and hypostatic origin of the other persons of the Trinity. All right. And so we see in On the Trinity, Augustine makes reference to this um, when he quotes John 7, 16. He does so frequency, uh, frequently, frequency, frequently. So for example, John 7, 16, um, as he has given doctrine to the Son, and so commenting on this in book two, paragraph four, Augustine writes, he has given doctrine to the son may be rightly understood to mean he has begotten the son who is doctrine. So that when it said, my doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me, it is so to be understood as it were, I am not from myself, but from him who sent me. So what Augustine is saying when he cites John 7, 16, is that the doctrine properly belongs to the Father, just like divinity properly belongs to the Father. It's a reference to origin. So we have to pay careful attention whenever Augustine is referring to John 7, 16 within on the Trinity. Now, Augustine especially does this in Book 2, Paragraph 5 um, of On the Trinity. And um, bear with me, audience, I'm going to read it to you. He says, except... He had immediately gone on to say after this, all things that the Father has are mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you, John 16, 15. It might perhaps have been believed that the Holy Spirit was so born of Christ as Christ is of the Father. The proceeding may be supposed to be true since he had said of himself, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. But of the Holy Spirit, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and... For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. So I'm going to just break, you know, cut it out for a second. It sounds like what Augustine's saying in that first half of paragraph five in book two is, well, it would seem that the spirit is born of Christ because he's saying he gets things from Christ pretty much. That's, that's what he says. But now let's go back to Augustine. But because he has rendered the reason why he said he shall receive of mine, for he says, all things that the Father has are mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine. It remains that the Holy Spirit be understood to have of that which is the Father's, as the Son also has, which is of the Father's. And how can this be unless according to that which we have said above, but when the Comforter has come and whom I will send you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify me. He is said, therefore, not to speak of himself in that he proceeds from the Father. So we see in Book 2, Paragraph 5, that Augustine actually toys, well, it sounds like the Spirit comes from the Son, and then he completely refutes it, if we keep reading the paragraph. Um, and so either I'm portraying to you that paragraph wrong. Again, I'm telling you guys tonight, you got to read this cover to cover to understand. You can't take Timothy's word, my word for it. Or you got to accuse you got to accuse Augustine of being inconsistent within this book, which I think is unacceptable. I think we need to give the saints a little more credibility that they're they're inconsistent internally within these things. So, being that we have an indication that when Augustine cites the doctrine, right, not being Christ but the Father's, has to do with origins, we see that he actually uses that to show that the Spirit is from the Father. So. We could get to more into that, but I'm going to leave that aside for now because probably the most important thing for you guys to understand from On the Trinity are the illustrations because the illustrations Augustine gives not so coincidentally mirror the incarnation, mirror the consecration, the Eucharist. Um, I forget in the top of my head, but Augustine at one point even refers to the consecration, the Eucharist. So this is something he was aware, the sort of sacramental theology. 
Now, Augustine says in book three in the beginning, I think it's in the first paragraph, but he says, we're not so well versed in Greek theology, and I do not doubt any answers on this question could be found among the Greeks. But he says, because we don't have that, I will speculate and hopefully come to the right same conclusion they came to. Now, that's what I just veered off into very rough paraphrase, but you go read it for yourself if you want it more specifically. Now, the reason I bring that up is Augustine's theology was this. If the human mind is made in the image of God, then if I rightly understand the human mind, I can understand who God is. So I don't need the theology of the Greeks. Through understanding the image of God, right, that sacramental presence of God in man, then I can understand the Trinity. It is very insightful, and it's something that St. Gregory Palamas seizes upon, and something that's ignored a lot because people don't want to do the dirty work of reading the illustrations and trying to understand what he's saying. I'm going to give a very rough overview of these illustrations. So he gives illustrations of knowledge, love, and vision. And he argues that all follow the pattern of being from the Father, right? Knowledge is from the Father, or love's from the Father, or visions from the Father, through the Son, and in the Holy Spirit, right? That it's a harmony of being from the Father through the Son. And not coincidentally, each illustration matches this mold of Romans 11.36. So... I don't know, Timothy, if I'm taking too much time. So if people want me to unpack these, I could get into it. Um, do I have a few more minutes? Yeah, go ahead. I'm mean, no so <laughs> in book nine, paragraph 18, he, I'm trying to give you like as distilled as possible what, uh, what Augustine says about knowledge. So Augustine says, um, the bringing forth of not, the bringing forth of, and he's speaking of knowledge from the mind, the mind is speaking of the father, is preceded by some desire, we're going to find out that's the spirit, by which through seeking and finding what we wish to know, the offspring, that's, a, that's terminology that pertains to generation, so knowledge, which is the son, because he's the offspring, itself is born. So let me repeat that. The bringing forth from the mind, the father, is preceded, preceded by some desire, which is the spirit, by which, through seeking and finding what we wish to know, the offspring, knowledge, which is the Son, itself is born. Right? It's the same thing as consecration, same thing as incarnation. This is how the mode is following. So he writes, And for this reason, that desire by which knowledge is conceived and brought forth cannot rightly be called the bringing forth in the offspring. Right? Desire is not begotten. Right? The spirit is not begotten. He's proceeded. And the same desire which led us to long for knowing of the thing becomes the love, spirit, of the thing when known while it holds and embraces it accepted, its accepted offspring. That is knowledge and unites it to the begetter. And so there's a kind of image of the Trinity in the mind. So if we know Damascene, he says that the spirit proceeds from the father and rests in the son. So look at Augustine's language where he says, the same desire which led us to long for knowing, right? The mind wants to know something of the thing, becomes the love of the thing when known while it holds and embraces its accepted offspring, right? So hold and embraces is like rest, rest in the sun. It's the same exact idea that Damascenes talk about. And so that is knowledge and it unites knowledge to its begetter. And so there's a kind of image of the Trinity in the mind. So in summary, knowledge is from the Father through actually knowing which is the Logos, right? Logos is word. It has to do with knowledge. And in that desire to know which is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit proceeds from the Father alone in that illustration, right? And rests in the Son in order to hypostatically exist. This is, why, this is what Augustine means when he says the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son as a single principle. Because Augustine uses that language of principle. He's speaking of that one event. But when we unpack the event, the cause is the Father. Um, so now let's talk about love. <laughs> it's not a song, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about love, but not the, not the song. So Augustine in Book 15, Paragraph 6, says, The Trinity to wit, one that loves, and that is loved, and love. So the Trinity, according to Augustine, is a lover, the beloved, and love from the lover to the beloved, right? So love comes 
from the father to the son. You know, so the origin or cause of love, again, is the father, and it rests when the father loves the son. Of course, the son loves back, Augustine even says so. But um, we would agree for the sacramental reality to be true, you don't need reciprocation, right? So according to Augustine, we could see, as he says in book 12, paragraph 6, unchangeable love existing as it does from him, the father, and not from the son, because when that bodily object was in place while held, looked at, and loved, produces a sort of trinity. So when the son is loved by the father, the trinity hypostatically exists. That's the interrelational occurrence that exists. So if you rightly understand love, as St. Gregory Palmas did, as Augustine is using the actual illustration and on the trinity, it doesn't jive with the idea that the son is a co-cause with the father, which is something we must accept if we take Florence and Lyon seriously because they use the word cause. And in fact, the Greek word cause is used in Florence. Now let's talk about vision. So vision has the mind or soul because Augustine uses both words interchangeably, which of course makes it confusing to the interpreter. Then there's will or attention, which is the same thing, which we'll unpack. And then there's vision, which is Christ. Um, this takes a lot of unpacking a patient's audience because this is the most difficult of all the examples. And Augustine really doesn't give us a really snazzy one-liner to understand it. But think of vision. What is vision right now? You're looking at a screen. The screen is physical, right? But the colors and stuff in your eye and your interpretation of what you're physically seeing is spiritual, right? It's what you're actually perceiving in your mind of, of the vision is not something physical, though you're looking at something physical. So that's why Augustine uses vision as a sacra sacramental reality of the sun, because the sun is the logos made flesh, right? The essence, uh, the essence of God is not something material or physical, um, yet Christ is material and physical. So the essence and energies of God are within the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. So the essence actually materially exists in the logos made flesh, which is completely fascinating and blows my mind. But that's why Augustine uses vision as uh, a reference to um, the sun. So in book 11, paragraph 9, Augustine writes, But the vision which comes into existence in this sense has something spiritual mingled with it, since it cannot come into existence without the soul. That's the mind. But it's not wholly spiritual, since that which is formed is a sense of the body. Therefore, the will which unites both is confessedly more spiritual. And so it begins to suggest, as it were, the person of the spirit in the Trinity. So we could see it's not just me reading this and just popping names where these different ideas Augustine has. Augustine says the person of the spirit is the will. All right. Also, book 11, paragraph 9. Therefore, the will which unites both the quasi-parent the body and the quasi child is more spiritual than either of them for that bodily thing, which is discerned is not spiritual at all. Therefore we can neither call the will, the quasi offspring of vision since it existed before vision. Well, this is important because again, people accuse Augustine of saying the son is the cause of the spirit. Here we have Augustine speaking within his illustration that the will perceive is not the offspring of vision because it preceded vision, which makes sense because again, that exists in the incarnation, that exists in the consecration of the Eucharist. It's the same sacramental reality that Augustine's talking about. Um, <clears throat> so also in book 11, paragraph five, Augustine speaks of this, that the will of the mind, remember will we disagreed is the spirit, the will of the mind, which applies the sense, the sensible thing, is of the soul alone because it is the will. Now, if we accept the premise that the soul is the same thing as the mind, we just had a statement from Augustine that the spirit is of the father alone. Paragraph two of the same book. This attention of the mind, which keeps the sense in that thing which we see and connects them both, right? The harmony between what is seen and the mind not only differs from the visible thing in nature in that one is mind and the other body, but also from the sense and the vision itself, since the attention is the act of the mind alone, right? The desire to see something, the will to see something. 
he calls it the attention there. But he says the act of the mind alone. If you go in the Latin, it actually literally says that it's a soleus anima. And so it says mind alone. So this is not a bad English translation. This is right in the Latin. Um, so having laid that groundwork, I'm going to read two more parts of book 11. It says, for the sense, he's speaking of vision, and the will of an animate being belongs to the soul, right, belongs to the mind, not to the stone or the other bodily thing that we, that thing being seen. Its sense and will does not therefore proceed from the bodily thing as from a parent, right? So when we see something, it doesn't actually come from our flesh. Yet neither does it proceed from that other, as it were, offspring, namely the vision and form that is sense. So, right, seeing doesn't come from the actual physical thing you're looking at. For the will existed before the vision came to pass, which will apply the sense that was to be formed to the bodily thing that was to be discerned. For how could that which has not yet seen satisfy? And satisfaction means a will that rests content. So we again get that rest language, right? And like he talked about knowledge, um, the knower embracing what is known, and that's when the spirit exists. And so we get the same thing. When the, the soul sees what it wants to see, that will rest content. And that's really the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And uh, he says the, the same thing again in paragraph 10, the same book. Perhaps we can rightly call vision the end and rest of the will. So this is fascinating. This is exactly what we see in Damascene and Augustine. So when people are wrongly criticizing Augustine and saying, oh, he's totally out of step with orthodox pneumatology, um, if you read Blatterne, which is our only conciliar statement on pneumatology, it almost exclusively is quoting Damascene and on this exact point. So I don't think it's defensible to say Augustine is not a clue, uh, agreeing with Damascene on this. So as we could see, the will and attention that unites and connects both is from the mind and soul alone. We read that right from Augustine. And Augustine specifically defines the, um, the will and the, uh, and the attention to be the Holy Spirit. And we also see that Augustine explicitly, explicitly denies that the spirit proceeds from the vision of son. He says that he precedes the vision. So, in fact, just like the other illustrations where the spirit precedes the son before he rested him, this is also true of the incarnation, the consecration. So let me sum everything we just said up in like, I don't know, one sentence, and I'm going to let Timothy talk because he's been way more than patient. And it takes a lot of patience to go through Augustine on this. Is what I'm not saying is that the spirit hypostatically existed before the son existed. Obviously, that's impossible. What I'm saying is when the father willed the son's existence to generate him, that will, when it becomes actualized, because the son is co-eternal with the father, when that will becomes actualized, when it rests in the son, when it embraces the son, when it becomes real, when it manifests, is when the spirit comes to be. And so in that sense, there's a single principle from the Father and the Son for the Spirit's existence because the Son being generated is what makes the Spirit rest in the Son, which is necessary for the Spirit's hypostatic existence. So that's Augustine's argument. And if you don't understand that, you can't understand Book 15, um, and which is where I find most people debating. There's just snippets from Book 15, but you have to understand Augustine's theology of the sacraments um, because that's what pervades the rest of the books. Sorry, I'll shut up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, what I heard you say is that there is a procession from the Father alone, but then you also pointed out there is a procession from the Father and the Son as from one principle, if it is understood as the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and resting on the Son eternally. Am yes, I right? This is what Damascene would teach, but using the and language, the Filioque language, would be um, authentically Augustinian. Um, that language wasn't used by Damascene, but my argument is it means the same thing. He literally used the word rest and talks about the same idea. Right. So I, it seems to me that the, the whole controversy boils down to the definition of the term cause, because mm -hmm. the Latins, as, as I read from Florence, it says that the son is son and the father are one cause, one principle of the Holy Spirit. And the really the crucial point is that the the Greeks object to ascribing causality to the sun. And there was actually a, a quote from Aquinas that you brought out in one of your writings, which I looked into, 
And I found an insight there that I, I thought was a very good one from Dave uh, Potencia that yeah. you quoted. Uh, mm -hmm. qu question 10, article one, uh, answer to objection eight. And he says this, quote, seldom or never do the Latin doctors employ the word cause to indicate the origin of the divine persons, both because with us cause connotes effect. And then he basically summarized, he says, we describe, we the Latins describe as a cause that when something different follows. So it's a very general idea of causality. It's something just that when something different follows. So it's some sort of relationship to a thing, sort of a cause and effect thing, but not an, not necessarily an origin. And then he points out, he says, the Greeks employ the word cause more absolutely when speaking of God and indicate origin only thereby. So I, I mean, from what you're saying, Craig, I, I mean, I don't, I, from what I can tell from Florence, where it discusses how the Father has given over the procession to the Holy Spirit to the Son, and that's how the Son has the procession. We're talking about a causality, which is what Aquinas is saying here that for when something different flows. He, the Florence is not asserting that the Son is an origin cause of the Spirit. Florence is asserting that, and I believe with Augustine, that. The father and the son, as you said, constitute one principle in the sense that the son has a causal relationship, but not an origin relationship. I think that the in this sense, the Florence would allow a procession from the father alone if we understand origin only. So I, I don't really see. So, I mean, it really comes down to me. I, I don't really see. I can't pin down the difference between, on the one hand, the Latin term is eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son as from one principle, meaning that the principle is the Father and the Son gains that principle from him. So the origin is always the Father, as opposed to the Greek terminology, which is the Father or the, the, the Spirit proceeds from the Father eternally and rests in the Son or is manifested through the Son eternally. I, I cannot see the difference because both doctrines maintain the causal origin in the Father alone. And both doctrines further assert there is an eternal relationship of the Son to the Spirit as well. And they use different terms to say that eternal relationship, but they both maintain that there is one. So can you maybe break down what do you see as the substantial difference between these two doctrines? Now, this is where obviously I'll be weaker because I don't pretend to be a expert in Florence or Lyon. The minutes don't. We were talking, I think, before we were on air. Um, we don't have the whole minutes in English. That means I can't interact with them in, on a very intelligent basis. So it would be depending upon secondary research. Um, but I would take issue where you say Florence will allow an origin from the father alone because that's ascribing something to Florence other than what Florence taught. Um, we see Florence speak of two principles being one principle, and they call it the word cause. I mean, that's actually what they use. They use the word that you're not supposed to use, and they use it in reference to the Father and the Son. And this was with the awareness that the Greeks had this absolute understanding of its meaning. And uh, not coincidentally, the filioque was in the Greek minutes, and the term procession in Greek was not altered. And so I think we do an injustice to the Roman Catholic sign in Florence when we ascribe to them having somehow a more capital O Orthodox doctrine of pneumatology than they did, um, because I think it's pretty clear that they say that the Father and Son is cause and that they're aware they're speaking of both as being absolute origins. And um, on that note, the fact that they rejected Maximus three times because Maximus drove home very specifically like Damascene that the father alone is cause. Um, they were not willing to accept that. And that was actually the reunion formula that was posed three times by the Orthodox side. So I just find it, you know, in a future reunion council, if Roman Catholics want to take that up, approach to what they see in Florence. Well, 
it might be very hard to because the Greek word cause being used the way it is within Florence, but it's not wrong for a Catholics to have a correct understanding of filioque. I just don't think you could really seriously pose that they're in Florence, they seriously believe that. Um, and I think that's why when I go into Aquinas and Aquinas himself, this is like when people say, oh, when you say two principles are one principle, you know, you're putting words in their mouth, but that's actually words from Aquinas' mouth. You know, Augustus, uh, Aquinas actually uses those words. And so when in Florence it says principle means cause, and then they say father and son are cause the spirit, it kind of contradicts what I think you're getting at, uh, Timothy. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm just really ignorant, but that's that's what it really sounds like to me. Well, I mean, <clears throat> the, the Council of Lyons, which they're making reference to explicitly dares the uh, condemns those who rashly dare to assert that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son from two as from two principles, not from one. And the the origin in the Father is from the end of the decree that I I, I mentioned when he when he, they reference Book fifteen, Chapter twenty seven of Augustine, when they say, since the Father Himself has given to His only begotten Son in generating Him all that the Father has, except being the Father. The son himself eternally has from the father from whom he is eternally from whom he is eternally generated precisely this that the holy spirit proceeds from the son that right there accords to me precisely with what what you assert as the slam dunk when you when you quoted in your writing you say this is book 429 what i just read from florence compare that to what augustine says he says uh, the Father is the beginning principium of the whole divinity, or if it is better so expressed, deity. He, therefore, who proceeds from the Father and from the Son is referred back to him from whom the Son was born. I, I see that as according the same substance of what I just read from Florence. The Father is the origin because the origin of the procession of the Spirit comes from the Father. The Son does not get the, so the, son does not get the or originating or the causal relationship from himself. If he did, there would be two causes. No, I think you're adding something there, though. You're you're adding something that Augustine doesn't say. You're saying, well, August and Augustine says something to this effect elsewhere, but not pertaining to the point in book four, paragraph, I think, 29, maybe 28, I don't know, I think it's 29. But when the, the Father is the beginning or the principium of all divinity, right, it's Compare that to what it says in Florence, where it says the Holy Spirit, and this is in the succession, is eternally from the Father and the Son and has his essence and his subsistent being, which means his hypostatic origin. That's what subsistence pertains to. From the Father together with the Son and proceeds from both eternally as from one principle and a single spiration. And I'm just going to skip a few words. This bears a sense that thereby also the Son should be signified according to the Greeks, indeed, as cause, and according to the Latins, as principle of the subsistence of the Holy Spirit, just like the Father. And so I see that as a contradiction, actually, what Augustine says, because he says that the cause of divinity is the Father, not the Son. Um, if you read Book 4, again, I think it's paragraph 29, he actually denies that the Spirit is, he says he's of the Son, but not from the Son, and it's precisely for that reason. Well, I mean, I would just answer with saying, quoting from book, I mean, taking together with what he says in book four, he says, the father is the principium of the whole divinity. Granted, he's the origin of the whole divinity. But he also says in the next book, book five, chapter 13, he says, the father and the son are a principium of the Holy Spirit, not two principia. And that's exactly the phraseology used in Florence. Not, not. And so you're, you're aware of the context, though, within book five is in the temporal procession. That's why in paragraph 15, he says they're one principle relatively. And we go, well, we, we don't think of what the term relatively means. It's speaking of pertaining to, and he says relatively to the creature. <laughs> so it's, it's explicitly about the temporal procession because it's about the spirit proceeding to. <laughs> us in creation. So I don't deny that the temple procession is going to have ramifications and reflection in the eternal realm, but in the same sense, we cannot deny like with the incarnation or consecration, the same as the shoes on the other foot, the spirit proceeding 
um, the sun in that sense. And so I think when we're looking at that, we have to connect that to Augustine's illustrations, which would be the fact that they're both a single principle is because you need a father and a son for a spirit to rest in the sun, right? But it's not because the sun is origin. And as we already agreed, and Aquinas was well aware, for example, so the Latin theologians weren't unaware of this, um, they knew that the Greek word cause pertained to origins. And so by using that word with influence and then equating that the word principle, it, to me, without just saying Florence was wrong, I don't think you could, there's any reproachment using that counsel. Um. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would just say when you, when you were talking about the temporal procession and the creature, he's making reference to the fact, he's comparing the fact that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are one Lord, one principle relative to creation as a comparison to the fact that the Father and the Son are also one principle of the Holy Spirit. He's saying that two two persons can be one principle or more than one person can be principle. But regarding the eternal procession, that's when we go to book 15, where he explicitly says that there is the eternal procession from both. Uh, book 15, chapter 27, paragraph 47. As the Father has in himself that the Holy Spirit proce should proceed from him, so that he give it, so has he given to the Son that the same Holy Spirit should proceed from the him and be both apart from time. And that the Holy Spirit is so said to proceed from the Father as that it to be understood that his proceeding also from the Son is a property derived by the Son from the Father. There's the origin. And just as the generation from the Father, without any changeableness of nature, gives to the Son essence without beginning of time, so procession from both, without any changeableness of nature, gives to the Holy Spirit essence without beginning of time. So, you want to well, have early, any... Earlier in, that same, earlier in the same paragraph, though, Origin says, and the origin. <laughs> it's We're getting like, this about, past my bedtime. Talking too much about origins. <laughs> <laughs> this past my bedtime. Um, we'll wrap up. I'm just says, yeah. We do find times that the will proceeds from the human mind first, in order that may be sought, which, when found, may be called offspring. Which offspring, being already brought forth or born, that will is made perfect, resting in this end. Right. So. What you're trying to get at is what I already just said. It's the, it's Damascene's pneumatology is what Augustus explaining using Western, really authentically Augustinian language. He invented it, and so I think what you're getting at is looking at half of paragraph 47, and then not looking at the first half of the paragraph, and then not looking how he's saying resting in this ends how Augustine uses that term in Book 11. So that's why we can't look at these passages divorced from the illustrations that Augustine gives because he's referring to them as he um, as he makes these, drives home these points, summarizing the book 15. In fact, the last paragraph, I think it's 49, if I remember right, in book 15, he refers one last time to his illustrations and then paragraph 50 is uh, just him praying that he hope he didn't screw anything up, which is typical of Augustine's books, like he does the same in the Confessions. Um, so it's, that's why, like, I had to do this presentation with the illustrations because my point to you would be is he's not saying that the father and son are hypostatic causes of the spirit because that'd be contradicting the illustrations he gets. And that's precisely what he's referring to earlier in that paragraph. Okay. Um, so the, I'm just going to take questions. We're going to wrap up pretty soon here. Um, please specify who you'd like to direct the question to as well. Um, we have uh, one question for Craig. Joseph says, do you think, Craig, you are downplaying how the Orthodox, besides Mark of Ephesus, all accepted Florence? Um, obviously, that, there, there's Eastern Catholics, yeah, there's Eastern Catholics who do accept Florence, but obviously, but those are, they do exist. But go ahead. That's a phenomenal question. Um, I don't think I'm downplaying it for... A few reasons. One, um, the Bishop of Constantinople died, and the official legate to the Bishop of Alexandria was Mark Ephesus. You already have half the Pentarchy not, not conceding to the council. So even if once they have a new Bishop of Constantinople, he signs it to the council, 
You have also the Council of Jerusalem 1443, where Alexandria and Jerusalem officially, you know, and Antioch all denied the council and disown what the legates did. Obviously, Alexandria didn't disown Mark Ephesus, but you get the point. Um, so we wouldn't hold the other councils to that sort of standard. It's sort of like this mythology of Florence. It's somewhat inaccurate. I would have to respectfully disagree with Joe Heschmeyer, and I, I credit Joe Heschmeyer with my salvation in part, because he's part of the reason I'm in the Orthodox Church. I'm not saying that to beat up on him. And that includes you, that includes uh, Matthew, Paul, Tony, and a lot of guys that were on Shameless Mulberry. But that being said, it's we have to look at the fact that if not all the bishops signed on to it, the legates that did sign on to it were disowned. Um, and lastly, there's also the issue that a lot of these guys were starved into submission. You need the, con the consent of the will can't occur under duress. Otherwise, we'd have issues with uh, Pope Liberius, where even Athanasius gave him a pass because he was tortured into signing the Arianized Creed. So I'm not going to say, oh, look, Pope Liberius was a heretic because Athanasius didn't consider him a heretic. He was tortured into doing it. So, no, we can't look at what someone did under torture, duress, and not even all of them really signed on to it as, you know, there being actual consent. Right. That, and, that, and that's the, the there, there's an article on my website called Scholarly Consensus on Florence. And essentially the, the debate about Florence goes back and forth as to how much it was under the duress, how much it was not. Uh, my video, Greek Schism Part 3, with an Eastern Catholic, we talk about the Catholic perspective on Florence. Um, but I want to get to further questions. Um, Emil says, doesn't Florence explicitly say that the Holy Spirit derives his essence from the Father and the Son? Yes, that's the quote that I read. Um, Lord have mercy. How can you both say that the Orthodox position on St. Augustine is negative when three of the most important Orthodox writers in the 20th century considered him saint or blessed? Rose Popovich and Sisiov. Uh, what do you say to that, Craig? I think only one of them is canonized, but I agree with your sentiment. The problem is what's popularly considered orthodox, right? Like, uh, my I have several books from uh, Father Daniel Sezoya. He's he's a martyr. I believe he will be canonized sooner rather than later. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting. The saints have no problem quoting Augustine. I think uh, Saint Philip in Moscow had no problem quoting, you know, Saint Augustine. It seems like it's people that don't have Saint in front of their name that have issues with Augustine. And I was catechized very basically. Um, you know, it's a good book if it has Saint in front of the guy's name. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I tend to agree. Augustine was fundamental in my own conversion. Reading his Confessions, there's really no book like Confessions. I think it, it's it's hard to. To be honest, uh, no. my conversion is strictly because of that book as well, yeah. All right, there we go. Great. <laughs> Any other questions from anybody? And we'll wrap up here. Um, let me just see if anybody... Any comments? Anyone want, to, anyone want to call me a jerk? Say that Timothy looks handsome with his time on him? Any cool comments? <laughs> Any cool you know, we, we don't have any strong anti-Augustine Orthodox out there. I, I haven't seen a single comment that was disparaging Augustine. I so, do need to branch out your audience. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Like, here's what right. I, I want to say this. What I'm not trying to do is create some false reproachment of sorts. Like, you know, you don't want to say, oh, kumbaya, we all love Augustine. We all agree with each other or whatnot. But if we do all agree with each other on a certain point, we don't want to purposely make that divisive either, right? Like, we should be just let the chips fall where they may. I mean, that that's, I don't know, that's how I see it. So, like, when I read stuff from Augustine, it's right from Maximus and it's right from Damascene. And obviously, Damascene really was, I think, getting his theology more from Maximus. If you read Damascene, he's very thoroughly Maximinian or have you, whatever word they make up for that. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, you can't disown Augustine without disowning Damascene's pneumatology if you understand Augustine's pneumatology. That's, that's my argument. Right, absolutely. Um, yeah, we, we do need to divide over heresy if there's really a heresy, but if there's not a heresy, then we can't divide. They're, they're both on either side of, of the coin, terrible sins, either of schism or of heresy or of lack of charity. So, uh, but that is, that's pretty much it. I don't have any more. Um, let's see. Here's uh, one quote, or I guess one question here. Uh, what are Quegg's thoughts on this quote from Florence? And here's the quote from Florence. The Latins asserted that they say the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, not with the intention of excluding the Father from being the source of principle of all 
deity. Elijah, where is that quote from? Are we are you quoting the acta? Because that's not in my. I'm just quoting from Denziger here. I, I don't see that in here. I'm not sure where you got that. So if you could maybe clarify where you got that. But Craig, what what do you think of that in the meantime? I mean, this is where my understanding, and if we're gonna trust uh, Father Christian Cops, because this is where a lot of my background influence comes from. His article on the topic in Saint Mark of Ephesus. Um, that a lot of the people at Florence were um, pretty much followers of Aquinas. And uh, so to really understand um, what they're getting at, you have to really understand Aquinas. And Aquinas calls, you know, um, let me get to what Aquinas says actually on this issue. I'm just scrolling to it. It's my first article on this topic where I actually purposely try to argue the Roman Catholic case. And I really wasn't trying to be disingenuous. I had one Orthodox proofreader said, you convinced me, maybe they're right. So if I did that good a job arguing for the Roman Catholic case, I'd like to think at least I understand it okay. Um, now Aquinas speaks of something called a relation of principle. And what is a relation of principle? Um, because look at, Florence, look at Lyon. It, it says that there is one principle, right? One spiration, aren't two. That's not their argument. And so how do you get then square that with Aquinas talking about that the, the son is a principle from a principle and the father and the son are the principle for the Holy Spirit. And when uh, Aquinas speculates on this, he speaks of there being a relation of principle. So, well, what's that mean? It means that there's a single principle relative to the spirit because he's got two, two hypostatic co-causes, so to say, right? That's the single principle. It's like having a, an ox cart pulled by two ox and both are pulling it. That's the single principle of that cart being pulled. Um, but for the son, there would be, he would have his own principle you know, irregardless of what principle the spirit has, because the father is his principle. So there's a relation of principle. So in that sense, you could speak of there being two principles, and, and Aquinas explicitly does. And so I think when Orthodox sometimes even ignorantly say, Roman Catholics teach there's two principles for the Holy Spirit, well, that's wrong in as much as dogmatically they reject that terminology, but it would also be theologically incorrect for a Roman Catholic to say that the single principle doesn't have two principles. So, because Aquinas says it explicitly. So I hope that answers that question. You know, I'm not an expert in Latin theology, so I'd have to like actually read and give a more prepared answer. Um, you're more than welcome to write a, a comment on my blog and I'll give you more time to actually like look into it. And, sure, sure. You know, all right, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, yeah, so that's really all we have. We just wanted to get some back and forth on this. Uh, you can check out Craig's writing on this subject. It's linked below, as well as my own, as well as the Catholic view on a lot of these things is in the history uh, shows we've done. So, Craig, thanks so much for coming on. Any final words before we close up? Um, I just want to say thank you for having me on. I purposely... Um really waited. I didn't even comment on my own YouTube on this because I wanted to do it on your show. Um, you're the one who got me started on this. You've been a class act for years. Um, and it's something I greatly appreciate. And I appreciate disagreeing with someone who's a class act. It's a lot more of a pleasure to do than someone who's a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we both we both were converted by the confession, so that's why that's why we we enjoy <laughs> we enjoy talking about this. So, so thanks a lot, Craig. Thanks for all the comments. Uh, you can comment below, um, or you can go to Craig's site and comment if you want to talk with Craig. Uh, so for now, God bless everybody. Have a good night. Have a good one. Adios.